actually really excited to hear what our next presenters uh, uh, have to say. Jonathan, who's leading this team, Jonathan Wilkenfeld, is an award-winning professor in the Department of Government and Politics and uh, director of the Center for International Development and Conflict Management at the University of Maryland. And six, since 1977, he, wa he served as co-director of the International Crisis Behavior Project, which is a cross-national study of international crises in the 20th and 21st centuries. And in 1981, he founded what was a really path-breaking initiative, the International Communications and Negotiation Simulations. It's a long time ago to be doing simulations. Um, uh, so that's the ICONS project that he's going to be talking to us about today, which is an internet-based foreign policy simulation project which has reached students in hundreds of universities and high schools over the past 20 years, as well as reached deeply into the policy community. Um, so, as I say, a real pioneer in this field, and we are really lucky to have him here. So, Jonathan? So, just yesterday, in my office, uh, Dick Dreck, who is co-founder, uh, we were reminiscing about how we came up with icons, and it turns out it was on a beach in uh, Nice, where, uh, and I wasn't there, actually. I was, <laughs> I was back in D.C., but Dick was on the beach. Uh, so le I feel decidedly low-tech today, so considering what, what we've seen before, but I hope that uh, what we have for you today will be uh, nevertheless um, interesting and uh, provocative in terms of what you can do really without having to have the overlay of, uh, of a lot of sort of avatars and all those other things going on. Not to detract from them, but really to, to point out that there are a variety of ways that those of us who work in the simulation community can really do this work. So um, ICONS is, is the, um, well, let, me, let me just do one more thing. So I'll, I'm going to be assisted today by the director of ICONS, who's uh, Daniela Friedel, and also the education director of ICONS, uh, Audrey Tete, and uh, they'll, they actually will answer all the questions that I can't possibly answer once I get, get through this. Um, and I just want to point out one other thing in passing. Andy Blum, who is wor now works at, uh, here at, the USAID, uh, <laughs> at USIP, uh, was a former director of ICON. So you actually have a person in this building who knows a lot about this thing and can, um, and can help you uh, get through it if you need to. Um, and just one final note. The early stages of ICONS, which really go back to the early 80s, um, we had a considerable amount of support from USIP in those days. Uh, it, was, it was actually the early days of USIP as well. And uh, they, as an agency, uh, had the foresight to begin investing in the kind of uh, technology which, which today uh, has allowed many of these other developments to really, to really flourish. So uh, I don't think US, uh, USIP thinks of itself as a pioneer necessarily in technology. Um, just look at the screen, for example. But, the, uh, but nevertheless, uh, <laughs> nevertheless, uh, they did play a, a really tremendous role, and, and we want to thank them for, for all, that, all that support. Uh, and one other thing, well, let me, let me just run through this, uh, this next uh, slide, because that's what I was told, told to do. Actually, if you could turn the lights back on, I can't see what I'm doing here. Thanks. Um, so we're the training, and ICONS is the training and education arm of a larger Center for International Development and Conflict Management at the University of Maryland. And uh, it's been, as you've heard, around for about 25 years, uh, and it delivers online simulation exercises in international politics in general, foreign policy decision making, conflict, peace building, economic development, all of those uh, interlocking uh, and, and uh, uh, interconnecting sets of issues. We began as a university-based simulation. We began before the internet, and so you might wonder how we did all this stuff. We started with DARPAnet, and then we moved to Telenet, and then we moved to NSFNet, and we sort of followed the technology, always really focusing on uh, exercises which were text-based. We didn't, uh, not that I don't mean to detract from all the frills that you've seen here today, but we really wanted to focus on how people and nations negotiate with each other over complex interlocking and interconnected issues. 
And so it made a difference to us. I like to tell a story about how it makes a difference if you if you're inter if you're interacting with a team in Iowa, which is which is portraying Saudi Arabia. It makes a difference if you can actually see them, and it turns out that they're all wearing backwards baseball caps, and they look just like you and wherever else you are. But it somehow, if it's text-based, and they've been told to try to communicate in a diplomatic, using diplomatic language, it somehow makes the case a little bit. We've actually f fooled around with uh, with video conferencing, and we've actually come to the conclusion that it actually detract f detracts from what we're trying to do. So. And then one other, one other interesting contrast with, I, th I guess, the sense presentation this morning uh, was that we do multi-nation simulations. So uh, sense is, is, at least an I'm gathering, is a very elaborate model of a single society with lots of external players which have an impact on it, whereas we do less of a model of a, of a single society and more of a model of the international community in which a single actor is embedded. And that's, I think, an important distinction, and it sort of depends on what your objective is as to how you're going to, uh, as to which one of those two models you, you might choose to, to work with. Um, our, um, our capabilities have increased, but also the type of training we do have, have changed. So with high schools and universities, we were largely concerned with conveying knowledge. How do you get to understand issues um, you know, like human, human rights, security, national security, human security, uh, uh, international health issues, uh, and, and uh, issues and how they, how they interconnect with each other. As we moved into training for, uh, let's say, crisis management competency, uh, the issues weren't as important as the interactions among various agencies and, and, and the, the notion of building building team capacity to do decision making under crisis uh, conditions. And then as we moved a little bit into the corporate world, world and into um, the world of the think tanks, but primarily the corporate world, there the question often is, uh, if you take a corporation which has, uh, let's say a large corporation, which has all sorts of contingency plans for crises. So for example, you might be a large oil company which has to worry about what the, what the impact of, a, of uh, avian influenza or uh, SARS might be on the capacity to continue to pump oil at a particular location, or what might be the impact of a terrorist strike on, uh, on a pipeline, which is critical. Um, there what you're doing is helping those corporations test their standard operating procedures for crises that might develop, to, and they do these, as you know, many corporations do these on a regular basis to make sure not only that their employees are trained, but also that their procedures meet, meet the needs uh, of, of uh, evolving situations. And our job, of course, is to try to throw at them circumstances which are unanticipated and therefore need, need, to, be, uh, need to be dealt with. Um, so these are some of the uh, leadership competencies that we try to convey in our simulation. I, in a moment, I'm going to turn this over to my colleagues who are going to sort of walk you through a, a typical exercise. But these are some of the, uh, the competencies that we try to uh, convey in these uh, negotiation and crisis leadership uh, simulations. And here's a, a list of some of the, uh, we call them clients, but some of the groups that we've worked, for, worked with over the past few years. Uh, we do a good deal of work with the Office of Personnel Management, which brings in a lot of uh, trainees from all over the uh, federal government. Um, and then just, just to wrap up my part of this, the particular benefits of an ICON simulation, we try to keep it user-friendly. We try to make, to make it so that um, you can learn the system in a matter of minutes and you don't have to do a lot of, of prepping for it. Simulations can be tailored to any group of participants. It's a IconsNet is a platform on which can be hung really any scenario. Uh, it's engaging, it's interactive. The interactive part it really should not be minimized. We have the ability to monitor and facilitate each of these exercises uh, on an ongoing basis. At the end of the exercise, a complete transcript is made available of all of the communications which have taken place, even those which your team was not privy to during the course of an exercise. So you can find out why a particular actor acted in a certain way when you had predicted that they would act otherwise. And finally, it's flexibility. Uh, the, you know, if 
you have an internet connection, you can be participating in this from virtually any place in the world. All right, let me turn this over to Daniela to uh, demo it. Thank you, John, for that wonderful overview. Uh, so John is, the, in a sense, a founding father of IconsNet, so it's a great privilege to have him as my boss, but there's also a lot of pressure, as you can imagine. Um, I'm very excited to be in this room and have the audience of experts in conflict management and peace building, and also the audience that's very interested in online simulation. So I would say it's a good day for ICONS today. Um, what I'm going to do is just uh, briefly go over the system that we use and then allow you to ask questions. This is actually uh, an example of a simulation we did with the Office of Presidential Management in a leadership potential seminar. This is the first screen that our participants see uh, when they enter the negotiation. Uh, each team, in this case there were eight teams, each team is giving uh, a username and a password, and when they log in this is the screen that they see. This particular simulation is on the effects of globalization on the Niger Delta region of Nigeria. And participants were tasked to create uh, an agreement on economic and security issues in the region. Next tab that participants go to is the resources tab. Here, participants have an overview of the scenario that they're negotiating. They also have, if you look on the right-hand side, they also have the option to access their role sheets. So if you imagine eight different teams, each accessing their roles. And there's also a research library that gives them additional information that is useful in conducting the negotiation. Next tab is the reports tab. In this tab, this is prior to the actual start of the negotiation. Each of the teams are asked to answer the questions, and this is to actually aid them in the preparation for the negotiation. So all the negotiation experts in the room know that the preparation is the key, so we ask them to answer questions such as, what are your interests? What is your strategy in the negotiation? What is, the, uh, what is your BATNA, the best alternative to a negotiated agreement? Uh, I see my mentor, Dr. Zartman from SAI, so I hope I'm getting all of this right. Um, uh, but basically, this is to aid them in preparing for the upcoming negotiation. And let me just go back and show you that in this particular simulation, there were eight teams, and they're very diverse. I will list them just to show that. We had the Coalition of Women's Groups, Greenpeace, Human Rights Watch, Nigerian government, Nigerian military, Ogoni, Shell, and USA. So very diverse group. The next slide is, this shows the messages tab, and this is really where all the action takes place. When the first message is sent, that officially represents the uh, start of the negotiation, and participants send messages either to all other groups, or they also have an option to send private messages to just selected groups uh, that they choose. This allows them to conduct simultaneous negotiations. So they could be negotiating with two groups at the same time, and on the other hand, with the rest of the, the team. So it's very flexible in that sense. Again, if you just think of an email system, then if you can email, which I'm sure all of you can do very well, uh, you can conduct a simulation and use IconsNet. This is an example of a message, again, a participant will go to compose message and a window would pop up. They would have an option to select who the message is sent to and just hit the send button and it's done. In this simulation that we just saw, um, there were three rounds, I'll go back, and there were 359 messages sent by the participants. So you can see that it's very interactive, very, um, in participants are very engaged. Next step is the proposals tab, and this gives uh, an opportunity to participants to write proposals. I will show you an example. In this case, Nigerian government wrote a proposal on the security and economic issues. At the end of the negotiation, participants vote on the proposals and decide which ones get passed. This tab is the conferences tab, and although it wasn't used in the, in the Nigerian simulation, 
Um, it is a very useful tool and it was used in the international system negotiation. It gives participants an opportunity to conduct an online meeting on a particular subject. If you think of an IM system or chat, I'm sure all of you use it. So it gives participants an opportunity to get together, discuss a particular issue, and this uh, exchange is also monitored by the facilitator who kind of guides the discussion. Uh, in this particular simulation, uh, again, the, it's called the International System Simulation, we had 14 different universities in eight countries participating in this simulation, and I believe the total was close to 500 participants that we had in one simulation. So uh, there's absolutely no limits as to how many participants you can have uh, from pretty much all over the world. This last, I just wanted to show you some pictures. We conducted um, this last week, and it was the India-Pakistan simulation. And the simulation was conducted for the Maryland Leadership Institute at the University of Maryland and the Public Policy and International Affairs Fellows at the Carnegie Mellon University. So you had a group at the Carnegie Mellon and here at the University of Maryland, and they conducted a simulation online. And uh, after the simulation was completed, um, they did a live video conference debrief, which gave them an opportunity to see each other and uh, also exchange notes and share their different experiences from the simulation. Uh, I believe that that concludes our presentation. We welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you all. Questions about the ICONS project? Uh, Andrew Oaken, uh, unaffiliated. Uh, what constraints are there on the kinds of agreements they can reach and the kinds of actions they can take? Can uh, is there a, a tab for the uh, Ogoni to have an uprising uh, or do something bad? Uh, can you have binding agreements that cut other parties out entirely? Uh, what is the the action range that is allowed? No, that is a great question. One, one area of the system, because we knew we were a little short on time that we didn't cover, is called an actions tab, actually. Wonderful. Yes. Um, and in some of our simula simulations, we use that tab to provide a list of selected actions, uh, unilateral moves, for example, that an actor can take within the simulation. So the Ogoni may have a list mm -hmm. of um, possible things that they can do within the simulation that could affect the outcome. Um, we also, with the proposals, have two different types of proposals. One is a very structured system where they have a list, for example, of options on how to address security issues or economic issues. They can kind of build their proposal from there and submit it. In some other simulations, there's an open text box there in the proposal area, and they're responsible for completely forming the idea and the way that they're going to present it to others. So we have flexibility in those two different options. And also to add to that, if I may, when I um, spoke of the facilitator, we have a person that we call the SimCon, and that's the person that monitors the actual negotiation and makes decisions. So if a party submits a proposal, the proposal will have to be approved by the SimCon be before it's introduced to the rest of the group. So there's definitely a way to control the flow of the simulation. Julia Lochran, ThoughtLink. Um, I wondered if you could describe the, uh, after the exercise is over, the after action review component, people stepping out. Do you use um, like a synchronous text chat for that component? Um, how do you kind of build in the lessons learned from the actual exercise when it's completed? Um, thank you for the question. Um, basically for the debrief, uh, a lot of times our simulations are a part of a larger training. So for the Office of Presidential Management, we teach negotiation skills and leadership skills. So the simulation is really an opportunity for the participants to exercise the tools that we provided them prior to the start of the negotiation. So the debrief is really to evaluate their performance, the preparation they did prior to the negotiation and the lessons learned. What are the takeaways uh, that they will walk away with going back to their workplace? What have they? 
for it, it's done multiple ways. So for this particular one that I covered in the Nigerian simulation, uh, we are actually out in West Virginia, in Shepherdstown. So participants are divided in the in different rooms, and then they come together in one room for a debrief. So, yes. All right. I'm trying to get to folks first who haven't had a chance to ask questions yet. Right, Peter Perla, CNA. Uh, how does the system determine the results of the player's interactions? Is there a model underlying this, or is it something different? Thank you for the question. Um, the model is actually to use the rep uh, expertise that we have in-house, which is one be great benefit that we're housed at the Center for uh, Interest Development and Conflict Management. So it's uh, our experts that evaluate uh, the performance of the participants. So there is no, we don't necessarily have a tool that measures their performance, but it's us when we monitor the actual participation. And the ability to go back, as John mentioned, that we have the ability, everything that is inputted into the system is recorded. So we have the ability to go back and review all the notes and messages that were sent. So we can also monitor and determine, okay, what is the point at which negotiation turn to the other, in, in the other direction? So what are the, some of the deciding moments that aided or disrupted the negotiation? That, does that answer your question? Actually, no. What I, was, what I was interested in is within the game world itself, how do things develop? Sense has models. Mm -hmm. How does your game advance the state of nature in, in the play? All right. So let me, t let me take a crack at that. So it's, it's completely free form. We have no clue how these things are going to end. We have some clues because we're political scientists mostly. But... Um, uh, so unlike, uh, so there isn't an underlying model that if they start sort of veering too far away from what we consider to be reality, it's, it's, a, it's considered a failure. We do use the SimCon um, uh, uh, oversight to make sure they don't get so far away from reality that it's no longer constructive. So, uh, you know, a, a country in the middle of Europe can't discover oil and solve all of their economic problems and not be dependent on the Soviet Union or Iran or whatever, I mean, Russia or Iran or whatever the case may be. So, uh, so we have to keep it within bounds, but also allow for the creativity, which, is, which, you, which you can get by being in a simulation. And you a little bit step back from your regular job or your regular training and, and, uh, and begin to brainstorm about what might be possible. We don't expect in some of our simulations to solve the Palestine-Israel problem. But every once in a while, some really creative new ideas come up, which, which uh, are, are interesting. Hi, Ellie Goldberg with uh, Booz Allen Hamilton. A um, couple questions just in terms of how it, you know, the processes or methodologies you use to actually run the, run the, um, the simulation. For example, is there a facilitator that's assigned to um, each stakeholder entity, is there um, an analyst or an intern or a technographer whose job is to input uh, the information into the tool? And then, John, you mentioned, I think, in your early remarks that during the debrief, during the reveal all, if you will, that uh, there's an opportunity for folks to get a sense of the strategies and the thinking that each of the stakeholder entities um, mm -hmm. uh, were discussing or thinking about. And I was wondering how that's captured, because if it appears at least as I understand it, if it's not typed into the system, it's not captured. So if the, if the team is, is deliberating on an issue and there wasn't a consensus, majority, minority, do you have an ability to capture um, the richness of that discussion for, uh, for follow-on uh, uh, follow analysis? Thank you. Well, let me take a couple of cracks at that, and, and then uh, <coughs> maybe my colleagues can, can amplify further. Those are really good questions. Um, typically, an exercise, if, you, if you're talking about, let's say, a university-based exercise, Typically, it's a classroom at Iowa State University or something like that. So the, so the in local instructor is actually the, the person who convenes the team, who sets some ground rules, who might, who actually chooses which country they want to represent so that it fits into the curriculum in some you know, constructive way. <coughs> and they'll <coughs> excuse me, uh, pick an exercise which is going to fall into whatever the curriculum is looking at. We've uh, maybe maybe Audrey can sort of list the uh, various simulation simulations that we have sort of canned in addition to ones that we develop not on the fly but develop for particular clients for their for their particular needs 
So it's very carefully done, and then uh, as you saw in, uh, I guess, one of the slides, the, um, the um, uh, well, now I'm totally lost, but the, uh, uh, the resource center, which appears up on the top here, will have the, the uh, scenario, will have background information, the CIA fact book is, is sort of in there, so, so students, whoever the participants are, whether they're students or practitioners, they can get to relevant information in a timely, timely way. Do you want to talk about the post, post scenario? Sure, and then you can address it. Also, to uh, answer the portion of your question that um, uh, talked about the, the, simul the actual simulation, we have an in-house simulation expert developer who basically uh, creates scenarios uh, by using his expertise, but also interviewing ex experts in the field. So we can't really claim that we're experts in all areas, uh, but we, we, you, uh, we use the CIDCM expertise as well as expertise that we can find in, in the DC area. Uh, we do interviews and that's kind of how simulations are developed. Um, Right. I'm, <clears throat> I'm going to have to move this along because I can see icons has really sparked the imagination here. There are lots and lots of hands up in the room. We can take one more question back there before we go to the folks online of someone who hasn't spoken yet. Great. I'm Armando Geller, George Mason University. I have a question um, with regard to what you do in order to um, get some insight with regard to the uh, more explanatory factors that go into your model. So how do you actually try to gather data to explain why certain actors in your simulation uh, act in particular ways? Is that also an aim of your simulation or not? Um, I think it definitely is. That's an excellent question. And I think it goes back to the fact that this is just a platform. What our focus is is on the participants. So our way of finding out why a particular group or a participant took a particular action is by asking them in the debrief, okay, what made you take that particular step? Uh, was it something that was decided in the preparation stage? Was it something that you decided based on the information that you received from a different group? So most of the gathering and analysis is done by simply talking to the participants about their experience and reasons for their particular decision making. Uh, as I said, one, the folks online have a chance to talk to us. Lots of interest in this uh, online, and I'll just pull together a, a couple of aspects where there's a, a lot of discussion. Uh, one is around this issue of text versus sort of richer, more complex environments. Um, actually, Tim Lenoir, who's here in the room, was on Twitter, and I'll, I think summed it up the best. Icons uses text chat for negotiation, but real world negotiation involves lots of face to face body language. Why no avatars video? Um, and a related question I'll, I'll pose as well. Isn't an English language based format a limiting factor for global negotiations? So how do you think about language and the evolution of the tool? So body language and linguistic language. Well, okay, so language. Let, let me start with linguistic language and we'll talk about body language. So uh, ICONS actually started with a grant from the U.S. Department of Education from, uh, I forget what division it was, Susanna Easton ran it, some of you may know her. Uh, and it was for foreign language and international negotiation. And we actually uh, worked with uh, four or five languages. We worked with uh, universities in Israel and Japan and in, that in those days in the Soviet Union. We had groups of students translating. Uh, uh, we had, we were, everything was transliterated. It was really very, you know, very difficult. But that's the origin of ICONS, and we still, in fact, do some, some uh, exercises and not just specialized exercises, but some exercises where, uh, f where, language, where the appropriate languages are used. And of course, that brings in all sorts of cultural and other kinds of, other kinds of consideration. Now, the, sec the second part of the question had to do with the, uh, the sort of body language. Yeah, we, we don't have that. Uh, we freely admit that we don't have that. And, um, and so we don't, we don't have the full picture of what it takes to negotiate, except when we're doing specialized we just did a, uh, an exercise with, uh, I can't actually tell you who we did it with, but it was, well, we did it with Brookings, but I can't tell you who participated in it. Maybe someday. And um, uh, suffice to say, there were non-US and US participants. And since we were all in the same location, they uh, had the ability to then periodically conduct face-to-face -face communications in addition to the online uh, conferencing and online uh, exchange of messages. 
Remember that in the real world, the face-to-face, -face, often the face-to-face -face meeting is the last stage of a long, protracted exchange of views, exchanges of texts, and, and so forth. So when, you know, when Obama goes and meets with, uh, with his Russian counterparts and signs an agreement, it isn't like they just sat down and figured that out that morning, obviously. There's lots of people spend lots of time on computers probably exchanging messages. So we believe that we capture at least that important portion of the negotiation process. Okay, thank you all very much for my time.